would like to uh, turn over the floor to uh, John. You come to me. I have, a, I have a published article on environmentalism that's come out uh, this month, which I'm quite proud of. I looked at this article with a certain, uh, uh, from a certain point of view. Um, I asked myself a question, can a non-scientist, and I'm not a physical scientist, I'm, I'm in a uh, department of political, scientist, uh, political science, I have a classics background, my PhD is in classical studies, my first two books were on ancient Greek lawgivers, ancient Greek politics, I have a new book coming out in the spring on, on uh, military history, and I asked myself a question, uh, because I saw what was happening in Washington, can a non-scientist look at these kinds of issues? and look at the politics, look at what's happening in Washington. Can I make a rational judgment on these issues, or must I remain a skeptic? Must I just go along with this kind of thing because it's all too complicated to understand? And I came to two conclusions about this. The first conclusion was this. If you hear one of these global warming or global alarmist people tell you that this is all too complicated for you to understand, therefore you need to go along with them, then you need to look them in the eye and say, if it's too complicated for me to understand, then don't ask me to agree either. Yeah. Right? Because right. right. if it's too complicated for me to understand, then it's too complicated for me to agree. And if you think that I'm supposed to take you on faith, uh, you know, because you say so, then you might be talking some form of religion, you might be talking some form of political consensus, but you're not talking science. If it's too complicated for me to understand, then you have no right to ask me to agree. And then the second point I realized is that it's not so complicated that I can't make a rational judgment. It is too com it is very complicated. You start getting into things like solar analysis, what the solar scientists do. This stuff is deep, and I don't understand it, and I don't pretend to. You start getting into the climatology. I don't understand it. You know why? Because nobody understands it. The entire science is in its infancy. You know, um, uh, uh, Reed Bryson, I believe is his name. Is that, is that Al Gore's teacher, Paul? Where are you? Uh, is, is, that, is that Al Gore's teacher? Um, I believe that is his name. Uh, Al Gore cites him as, as turning him on to all of this and, and being the man who got him you know, so concerned with the fate of the earth that he published an article and said, no, we're not going to know enough to make a judgment on this stuff without at least 30, 40 more years of study. He knows that this is not, that, that it's not possible to make these judgments yet because the science is in its infancy. So I looked at it from the point of view of the natural history of the earth and I looked at it from terms of the history of the movement itself and asked whether I could make it a judgment and I formed the conclusion that yes, I can. I make a judgment this is all nonsense, it is driven by ideological reasons, not by scientific reasons, and it is driven by a political socialist purpose, not by a scientific purpose. And, I, and there's another level to my judgment about that that I think is important too. Even if I were to come to the conclusion that we human beings from our industry were in fact about to cause a global climate disaster, and let's be clear about what I'm talking about here. I am not talking about whether or not we are going to cause a 1.18 temperature, 1.18 degrees Celsius temperature rise over the next century. We're talking about people who are saying we are going to face a global climate disaster that's going to destroy us. That's what they're saying. We're talking about a global climate disaster. Even if I were to form the conclusion that our industry was going to cause a global climate disaster 50 years from now, I would not be arguing for the government programs that they're proposing. Why? Why not? The answer is obvious, because if we, were going to, if we were causing such a crisis, what would we need to get out of it? Freedom, innovation, people thinking, people working, industry working on the problem. Who would you want solving the problem? The post office? Right? Read about the cost overruns on the F-22 Raptor and ask yourself if you'd even want the Pentagon working on it. Right? The state of it is the Pentagon is in, a, is, is in its own crisis right now. I don't trust the Pentagon to defend the country any longer. Right? Who would you, would you, if we were causing that crisis? So in fact, we can make a political judgment apart from the scientific judgment. So these are the conclusions I came up with after burying myself in this stuff last year to come up with this article. The, now, what's going on in Washington right now 
is a plan, a motivated, highly motivated plan for a massive set of institutional infringements on our rights um, of, of, a, of a level and degree, I think, unseen in the history of this republic. Uh, there's, really a two, there's really two distinct programs out to do this. One is the socialized medicine plan, which if it were to pass as Obama wanted it, would destroy health care in this country. That's another subject. But the other is the EPA plans and the cap and trade plans in Congress. Now there are two basic, well, let's, let's talk about those a little bit. There are two basic ways the government is looking at, Washington was looking at, uh, increasing government power over industry on behalf of this alleged crisis. The first is through congressional action, through laws, and the second is through EPA action. The first through congressional action is through this cap and trade type bill. And the second bypasses the entire legislation process and just goes straight through regulation from the EPA. So you see the difference between the two? Now, the background to all of this comes out of an entire, a century, I think, of alarmist propaganda that has grown and grown and grown. It comes out of a culture, I think, a, a culture, philosophic culture, that's actually looking for some horrific disaster to fall on us and is desperate to find such a disaster. You go back and read the New York Times going back to the 1920s and 30s, you'll find that in the 1920s they were predicting massive global cooling. You go back into the 1880s and 1870s and read the first people talking, Arrhenius, Servetius uh, Arrhenius, who first came up with the idea of the metaphor of greenhouse gases. He was afraid, they were all afraid of a new ice age because they had come out of the Little Ice Age in the early 1800s, and they were desperately afraid that the glaciers would return. And they were afraid that lower CO2 might cause a return of the glaciers. They were afraid of a new ice age. So in the 20s, you'll find the New York Times printing, oh, there's an imminent return to global cooling. Then you'll find in the 30s and 40s articles saying, maybe the Earth is warming up unprecedented warming. And then you'll find cooling again in the 60s. Remember the nuclear winter? The idea that the Earth was going to get cold again? And then you find in the, in the 80s and 90s, of course, the global warming. And now the environmentalists have backed up again. You notice that global warming is actually passing away. Now it's climate change. What does climate change really mean? What's the change in terminology mean? It means it's very simple. See, you see, when I'm an academic professor, I talk straight on these things. The, the issue is very, very clear. There's a disaster that's going to hit us, but I have no idea see, you know, what it is. But I know it's coming. Now, anybody that says that, it doesn't have any idea what they're talking about, they're just motivated by the desire that there's going to be a disaster. And that's really the motivation behind all of this. There's going to be a disaster, so therefore we have to regulate. And when you know, when you hear that kind of thing, you know that regulation and control is ultimately the actual motive. And that's the motive behind all this. Now let's talk about cap and trade for a minute. The unleashing of the dogs of cap and trade has come out of years of lawsuits, um, which culminated in 2007 with a Supreme Court decision. A series of states, led by Massachusetts, but also others, I believe it was like 17 states and municipalities, sued the EPA. The Bush Environmental Protection Agency, uh, basically with its, at its head, Stephen Johnson, had refused to declare carbon dioxide an endangerment, make an endangerment ruling against CO2. They refused to declare that carbon dioxide was a danger to public health. Now, they're correct not to, not to declare it as such. Anybody here ever run a greenhouse? If you want to run a greenhouse, what do you have to do to get the plants blue? You pump CO2 into it. In researching my article, I found a website that gives you advice in case anybody here is interested in this on how to grow marijuana. In case anybody here is interested in this.